Good evening, everyone. Let me uh, warmly welcome you for the evening session. And also, on behalf of the workshop, uh, let's also welcome uh, Dr. Atre uh, to give us this uh, evening lecture. Sir. We are uh, so grateful that you could find time to be with us and uh, speak on the science, technology, and the future. Uh, there has been a series of lectures so far, and on mostly on energy uh, and issues relating to energy. And then we are likely to cover. Uh, some of the other issues in the next uh, few days. We are so grateful that you could find time to be with us. And I'm also grateful to Professor Nagappa, who has uh, kindly agreed to uh, chair this session. I'll hand over the floor to him uh, to conduct the proceedings. Over to you, sir. Thank you, there. Good evening, friends. Let me add my welcome also along with what uh, Subha just now said. Talking about science and technology is definitely not very complicated, I say, especially to today's speaker. But when you want to talk about future also, I think that adds a big dimension. Uh, how much one can forecast and how do you really view future and how much into the future? These are quite challenging, I should say. But to address this, I think we have got a really eminent person to speak about, speak to all of you on this topic, science, technology and the future. I think as far as I see Dr. Atre is perhaps known to all of you or you must have heard of him. There are some people from DRDO who would have perhaps uh, been around when he was uh, the scientific advisor. But uh, the form says that I must introduce, so let me just take a couple of minutes to take through some of his uh, achievements and accomplishments. If I read his total bio, I think I will be taking up all the time of the lecture. Dr. Atre is an electrical engineer. He did his BE in 1961 from the University of Mysore, followed by ME from the Indian of Science. He did his PhD from the University of Waterloo in Canada, 1967, also in electrical engineering. Uh, he stayed on in Canada, and he was with the University of Halifax, I think, Nova Scotia, University of Nova Scotia in Halifax. And uh, till 1980, when he came over there, he was the professor there in the department. He came initially as a principal scientific officer to the National uh, Physical and Oceanographic Laboratory at Kochi. Subsequently, he was the director of the laboratory. Uh, and during his uh, stewardship of the laboratory, a lot of human uh, and original state-of-the-art work was done in NPOL. I think today, whatever sonar systems that are currently being used by our naval and naval systems, to a large extent, are responsible. I mean, his, his responsibility and his uh, during his stewardship, all the development took place. Uh, in 1991, he took over as the chief controller of our R and D at DRDO headquarters, and subsequently, he succeeded Dr. Kalam as scientific advisor to the Raksha Mantri in 1999. And of course, he had the other uh, co-concurrent uh, or co-current uh, responsibility as uh, Director General of uh, the Aeronautical Development Establishment, the Secretary Department of Defense R&D, all those things which go together. Uh, even as CCR and Director Yathri took a lot of interest in what you look at the, those days it was the pioneering element, the smart structures. So he took a lot of interest in smart materials, and I remember he was, I was still in ISRO those days, he was coming and talking to Chairman ISRO on this topic, he talked to other departments also. And uh, he was the prime mover in the emerging area. He conceptualized and operationalized a multi-departmental. It involved Department of Science and Technology, DRDO itself, the Department of Space, the CSAR, and the Department of Information Technology in a multi-institutional initiative the National Program on Smart Materials. And he is, in that capacity with his passion, he also founded the president, uh, uh, founded the Institute of Smart Structures and System, of which he was the founder president. Needless to say, Dr. Atri has authored many papers, which have appeared in refereed international journals. journals. He's the author of three books, dealing with network theory, Filter design microsystems and micro and smart systems, which again is his passion. All these have been published by John Wiley. 
And during uh, the last four decades of his career, which is multifaceted career, I should say, teacher, researcher, technologist, technology manager, he's been an ex excellent uh, leader, an exceptional leader, I should say, and mentor. He continues to be active, currently visiting professor at the Indian Institute of Science, and the government seeks his advice on various matters, both government of Karnataka and the government of India. And very recently, he headed the Government of India Task Force to recommend guidelines for selecting private firms for the strategic partnership in very critical areas. These areas include submarines, missiles, aircraft, uh, where private venture in a big way is that the government is trying to promote. Dr. Rastri is the recipient of many awards and honors, too numerous for me to enumerate here. But the latest demands mention this year's Republic Day Honours, his name finds a mention. The Government of India has conferred the Padma Vibhushan on him. I'd like to congratulate you on this, sir. Thank you. <coughs> May I request Dr. Atri to tell us about science, technology, and the future? Dr. Atri, please. Thank you, Rajan. First, I must thank. Uh, Niyas and its director for inviting me to address you this evening. The topic is quite wondrous, science, technology, and the future. And I always wondered what I'm going to talk to a crowd which is already reasonably knowledgeable about science and technology. But there is no way I can say no to Niyas because I have been in some way involved with Niyas off and on ever since Raja Ramana's time. And so a director whom I have known him for now several decades said you are going to come and speak and uh, first. I would said yes, but uh, I didn't want to say what topic he would give. It doesn't matter. So I thought I will save some ideas and perception over this science and technology. I'm going to meander quite a bit. I'm certainly not going to talk anything about sonar systems, electronic warfare systems, or defense. Somehow we have seem to be in a era where science and technology has a, some or the other role to play in everything we do. The way we collect information, education ourselves, the way we exchange information and communicate with each other, the way we conduct business and do financial transactions, and so on. Our transportation systems, our methodology of spending our leisure hours, our health, all seem to depend on gadgets, systems, and instruments that have come out of technology. Thomas Friedman, in his uh, well-known book, Earth is Flat, goes on to uh, assert that with the globalization of the economy, that the impact of science and technology on society has been amplified immeasurably. He also goes on to say that the World Wide Web has provided access to hitherto inexorable technologies and services to all countries who can educate their manpower to invent and innovate, to capture this market, and concede that there is a possibility that the disparity between the haves and have-nots get reduced. Clearly, the science and technology are uh, engines which drive the development and progress of a country. Science is really a culture of a society. It's esoteric, it's curiosity-driven. But science also has some, some other property which some of us may not recognize just offshore. It changes our perception of the universe. It also changes our perception of our role in the universe. If you, if you go back and look at the Pythagorean concept of a geocentric world, Copernican revolution smashed it and made it a heliocentric world. 
And for a long time, we thought uh, the earth was created for us, the homo sapiens. Darwin still debunked it. We were, after all, a small twig in the phylogenetic tree coming at fag end of the evolution. But if you look at science and technology as a whole and go back and test the history of science and technology, say from Aristotelian times to today, science and technology was not coupled at all. They grew up separately. Technology was much more mundane, utility driven, done by an artisan, and it did not depend on science at all. Science was essentially an activity for our uh, really rich, leisurely uh, and clergies, if you look at all the initial phase of the science. In fact, they were, if, if you recall that they were all called philosophers at one stage. So people who could reason and try to interpret the nature and perhaps try to answer some of the questions theology had raised, where did it come from, how did it happen and so on. This matter of decoupling continued well into 17th century. In early 17th century, an English politician, author, man of letters, scientist called Sir Francis Bacon wrote a book called New Atlantis in which he creates an island and on that island there is a house called Solomon House where he collects a group of scientists and believes that science could be used for good of humanity. This was the first time somebody thought that science would be of use to humanity. It was the precursor of research in universities and institutions. Some people believed the group formed of Solomon's house formed the seeding for Royal Society whose fellowship is the most coveted fellowship among the scientists even today. Very soon followed Newton and mechanistic philosophy of life. Finally, some of the science and technology started coming together. But even then, it was well into industrial revolution when we started trying to explain the technology or engineering or gadgetry the science behind those gadgetry. You keep hearing all kinds of stories uh, how uh, Stevenson looked at the boiling of the kettle and thought that there is a motive force in steam and so that it could be used to steam engines. So science and technology got coupled only as late as the 17th to 18th century. So as we come to the 19th century, we find there's the, uh, the kind of work which we did in the 19th century was phenomenal compared to the times happened previously. So if you look towards the end of the 19th century, we had achieved so many things. For example, chemists had talked about compounds, how to generate compounds, gases. They had already identified all the uh, gases. Dalton had enunciated his atomic energy theory. Andrew Vissilas from Norway had looked at anatomy of human beings. William Harvey had looked at blood circulation. And James Clerk Maxwell put all the electromagnetic theory into beautiful four equations. So much so that Lord Kelvin, by the year in, 19, in 1899, makes a comment that there is nothing not much to be done in science. Everything has already been done. What you are going to do is add some decimal places in the coming decades. So such was the phenomenal growth of science and technology in the 19th century. But little did Kelvin realize that two of the most profound theories were just around the corner. In 1900, as you all know, Max. Max Planck, looking at black body radiation, looked as if this energy comes in packets 
which later on got called quanta. And the next 30 years of what happened in physics, you can really say is history. In fact, if you really want to know what happened in those next 30 years, you must read George Gamow's book, The 30 Years That Shook Physics. From nothing to you go, go and come to Schrodinger, Dirac, and all those things, Heisenberg, once and was laid the foundation for the future of science. Almost a perfect theory which explained every phenomena. Of course, it's a weird theory in some sense. Parallelly, Einstein changed the whole concept of science. He showed that the science, uh, space and time continuum and distortion in space-time continuum is what creates gravity. And hundred years from now, very recently you know, that we have finally discovered gravity waves. So you see, science, science has grown in spurts. For a short time there is a revolution. Then you slowly build on that revolution. What Max Planck and uh, Einstein did the revolution, for the next 30 years you built physics and everything took off from there. So science doesn't go continuously. But science and technology has one other role to play. Okay, it produces wealth for a country, it solves some of the problems, curiosity, driven and everything else. At the turn of this century, National Academy of Engineering brought out a thesis called Grand Challenges. If you go to web and uh, plus Grand Challenges, you'll see here they have listed certain number of things which challenges faced by technologists and engineers and believe that these have to be solved if you are to solve the predicaments of humanity. And many of these predicaments ar arise out of consumption of resources and unsustainable, the unsustainability of the resources we have. They also talk about some of the problems that may arise because of what technology has done to date. Like they talk about cyber security. They talk about over intelligence in nitrogenous cycle and how it is affecting agriculture. But the dominant issue there is energy, uh, uh, which I gather you've already had a few lectures in atomic energy and so, people and so on. You see, world consumes something like, uh, what, 600 uh, hectajoules of energy per year. And 80% of that comes from fossil fuels, coal, petroleum, and gas. In doing this, we are certainly affected, as you all know, very well know, how we are affected the environment. We talk about global warming, sea temperature rise, receding glaciers, flooding of the coastal areas, changing of the seasons, weather pattern, and everything. Hopefully, keeping our fingers crossed, the recent Paris Protocol the countries have agreed to look at this problem as a real problem and limit the rise in temperatures to 2 degrees, if not 1.5 degrees. This, if you know, the articles which are coming out after the Paris Convention, wants to do it in two steps. One is reduce the amount of carbon dioxide we debush into the atmosphere for the next 20 to 30 years by a number of innovative techniques, carbon tax and this and so on. I'm sure somebody will talk to you about in details of that. The second aspect is how to remove the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and bring it back to the pre-global warming era if possible. Then and only then the temperature will go to 1.5 degrees. Many skeptics don't believe that we will be able to do it. So we have to find other methods of Reducing global warming. In fact, they are contemplating something like science fiction types of activities. 
there is a new field of engineering created called was geoengineering which is start the mounting to building an umbrella for the earth to prevent the sunlight from reaching the earth and reducing the global warming so we want to spray sulfur aerosol into the stratospheric clouds build gigantic space mirrors and sprinkle aluminum foils which is what the airplanes and others do to track away the missiles so that all of them reflect the sun's rays and thus reduce the heat that is coming to this look look at, look at the kind of things which science talk about this is not a pure science fiction there are already projects in us to look at this geoengineering aspects look at the electrical energy we don't know when if ever we are going to succeed in nuclear fusion fusion so we all believe fundamentally that we might be saved by the sun and solar energy the solar energy at the surface of the earth is of the approximately what 1400 watts per square meter suppose you go to the upper end of the atmosphere it probably doubles or triples that density so again science fiction like activities build huge solar panels space based solar panels kilometers and kilometers length of solar panels convert the energy to microwave energy and beam it to the earth and reconvert it chinese and japanese uh, us uh, japanese and china uh, rather americans have program and japan is even contemplating an offshore island to receive this microwave energy and reconvert it so why am why am i bringing this to you majority of the problems we have created because of the exponential growth in technology is all anthropogenic fortunately with the capital f science and technology can provide solutions it depends on how well we use this to produce solutions if you come to 20th century probably the amount of knowledge we accumulated during the 20th century is far more than what you accumulated in the two previous millenniums there are marvels of technology two minimums to go let me cut a few of them first thing is a simple thing from right brother skitty hawk went to a supersonic aircraft and air travel is more of a norm than an exception we have st- started exploring space we have built huge rockets i am sure somebody will talk to you about it from space what we have done we can we have reached somehow been able to reach many of the plants at the same time we have also diving to the depths of the ocean we have built pressure hulls which are capable of taking it to the deepest trench available a uh, trench of the ocean called mariana trench just off japan so we have got two extremes we are looking at the outer reaches of space and at the same time we are looking at what we can do with the uh, sea another marvel from a simple for quantum mechanics concept of population inversion we have created lasers lasers which can be used in high large industries to do a very particular surgeon surgery ophthalmic surgery called lasik surgery so the span of this thing laser was predicted by einstein so look at the two extremes what we have done of course the phenomenal growth in communication at the beginning of the 20th century we were all looking at 
wireless communication then you went to wired communication came back to wireless communication and created the ubiquitous cell phone and we keep wondering how we ever lived without cell phone and the connectivity that is provided we started networking computers and created the world wide web and all the information is literally at our fingertips look at the kind of imaging systems we have done the tiniest of the tiniest to the mega g- g- galaxies billions of kilometers away from a serendipitous discovery of rontogen from x rays we have all kinds of medical diagnostic systems today mris pets cat scanners spiral ct and so on when you go to it's all all because of the technology microelectronics somewhere starting from the middle of the since previous century 1960s and you today you see without microelectronics not, not, there, is, there is virtually no technology and we are, even the microelectronics we are looking at now something more than more beyond more kind of technology and every few years we talk is the end of silicon but somehow silicon seems to persist and today we talk about silicon photonics we talk about lasers on a chip where you don't need conversion to the optical thing and back to the optical thing this laser can be directly mounted on a chip if you go to stanford you will see probably you will see a laser on a chip so the kind of things which we have done in the 20th century but still we we, we can say something like what lord kelvin did said that there is no more to be done in science and technology there is plenty more to be done in science and technology technology fo- forecasting is very very difficult and it's dangerous to predict technology but let's take a peek what what would be the technology in, let's say in 40 50 years or by the year, end of the century what do we do some of the, what are the main things which we do let's look at pure science few years back we already detected higgs bosons today we have detected gravitational waves maybe in next two decades you'll finally decide what this dark energy and dark matter are maybe it will allow us to peer as much beyond that what's called the planck time 9 to the power minus 43 seconds from the cataclysmic event which physicists call big bang maybe finally we will answer the question the theological question which has been bothering us from aristotelian times how did it all begin how did it get evolve into this kind of a thing there is a prediction by 1930s we will build colonies on moon maybe by the end of the decade we colonies on an asteroid and mars probably will baldevaraj will could give you a talk of the kind of propulsion systems that would be needed there is what's called a photon propulsion riding on a laser beam kind of light beam to reach the kind of speeds which would call perhaps the warp speed to follow the terminology from a tv show it's predicted by the end of the decade we will be able to reach mars in a matter of few days rather in a matter of few years we don't know that we will reach it or not we have tried our ex- our hands of teleportation i am sure we are nowhere near a saying scotty beam me up we have not reached that stage but we are looking at teleportations look at robots i have a feeling in next 20 years or maybe 30 years by the middle of the century robots would have become as common as household appliances of today 
Today, the artificial intelligence has progressed to an extent we can build what are called empathetic robots. Robots which listen to you on the inflection of your voice to decide whether you are angry, sad, joy, or cynical, and respond to you accordingly. But I personally think this century belongs to biology. For two or three reasons. We have to very soon at least understand exactly what these two scourges, cancer and uh, Alzheimer's are. And we have to start finding cures for them. But the area where a large amount of money is being spent outside India, even in India, you might have heard that uh, Indian Institute of Science got a grant of a 250 and odd crores to do neural research or brain center, neural, neural center. So we can call it the century of brain. We will finally understand how, how does this work? What, what do we mean by memory? What is long-term potentiation? How does it occur? Why, why does neural system have the kind of plasticity it has? Can we bind, build that kind of plasticity to our computers? Will we finally define what consciousness is about? If you look at the magazine like Scientific American over the last year or so, there have been several articles on what is, how to look, analyze sleep, how to analyze dreams, how to analyze long-term potentiation. And there are several things which we took for granted, but more by, more by intuition are finding scientific explanations. If a T-Rex is ch chasing you, Suddenly, the amount of blood flow into an area called amygdala in the brain increases, building a fear com complex. This was assumed. We assume if you are in a very pleasant atmosphere, we all feel good and euphoric. But it never been proved. Today, if you show a show a scene, war scene, or anxiety, or fight. They have proved that the flow, flow to amygdala has increased by functional MRIs, functional imaging MRIs. We also know that if you are in front of a Himalayan structure, all peaceful, the amount of uh, blood flow into the prefrontal cortex is very large. This is not science fiction. In fact, we conducted an experiment, we built some, some sensors for an experiment conducted in Nimhans. We keep hearing in Indian classical music, there are certain ragas you sing in the morning, that sagas you see in the evening. Is it true? Does it ev evoke that kind of a emotion? So we built sensors to pick them up from the uh, from fMRI. Clearly, when you play music, Certain neurons only fire. So the creation that you get in early morning, if the effect is true. And if you go to Nimhans, they will demonstrate to you how this is done. So brain research is going to be a very dominant research. Of course, the other one is we all want to live forever. Longevity. Telomeres or ending of telomeres is not the one. We all, all want to see whether we will become eternal. Amruta, whether we can find Amruta. And there are now clearly indications that longevity will be extended and a lot of people will probably live beyond 100. So these are the kinds of things which science and technology does. I can go on and on and indicate to you where such kind of a technologies will occur. 
If you are to believe the futurologists, people who predict what happens, to, like Nesbitt's or Ray Kurzweil, they tend to think humanity and technology are co-evolving, are still evolving. And sometime in the near future, you can't distinguish one from the other. But when all these evolutionary things are taking place in science and technology and we are building things which replicate us, we must also remember science and technology is not a neutral activity. Nothing comes without risk. When all this progress takes place on science and technology, do we have at least a modicum of wisdom how to realize the dream which Francis Bacon said about 300 years ago, that science must be used for the good of humanity. You see, science can be used or abused with intent or otherwise. And also something else we should all remember. There was a time when science was supposed to be a peacetime activity, the technology was supposed to be a wartime activity, science was global, technology is regional. All these myths are gone in the interconnected society. You cannot wish away technology. You can't say this technology is not necessary for India. 30 years back when I was looking at holding some important points in technology, somebody had told me that cell phones would become popular in India, I would have laughed. Today I tend to think next generation will be born with a hand like this. So technology cannot be wished away. What we have to design as a society, I think now there is a culture, what is the role we are going to play in the development of the technology? Enough of general generalities. Let me talk to you about uh, what I could single, single out two important technologies, which in my opinion has more profound effect on other, than others, material science. If you look at trace the human development of human civilization, we have named the epochs by materials. We said Stone Age, then Copper Age, Bronze Age, Iron Age, then Polymer Age perhaps, then Silicon Age. And we have arrived at a time when now we can actually build materials with the specified properties. You can indicate the properties you want and you are able to synthesize such a material. We arrived at this stage. Rajan was talk, uh, talk, Rajan Raman was talk, talking about uh, smart materials. What are they? They are the materials which act, react with the environment and change their properties. There are plenty of them. You go to a supermarket, you buy a thermochromic cup and you pour coffee, the color changes. The polymers get readjusted. There are many sense, thermosensitive materials. For example, what there is a material called SMA, shape memory alloy. As the name itself signifies, it remembers its shape. When the phase transition takes place, you can set the temperature at what the shape appears. I am sure many of you have seen Terminator 2. Will we create that liquid metal? We are not too far from it. Today, we will talk about beta materials, materials with negative reflective index and so on and so forth. We can virtually create a material which provides optical invisibility. And so, and material science virtually has it such a dominant role to play in every aspect of science and technology today. The other one is mi miniaturization. I have spent the last decade or so, so let me make a few comments about this miniaturization. 
starting from the famous speech which uh, Nobel laureate Feynman gave in 1959, there is sufficient room at the bottom. There has been a great challenge to reduce the size of the operation of the material. Today we can assemble a material molecule by molecule and atom by atom. And finally arrived at what, what generally is called micro nanotechnology. I do agree. Micro nanotechnology have not met the euphoric feeling it created. We are nowhere near uh, building so called or, or developing a, a self replicating nano robots, which uh, Eric Drexler talks about in his famous book, Engines of Creation. But again, a warning, should we create? Already science fiction writers have uh, having a field day. There is a book by Michael Crichton called Prey. And recently Robin Cook wrote a book called Nano, saying what happens if you find self-replicating robots, nano robots. But microtechnology for here to say someone, let me, Say a few minutes with them before I close. Micro nano system technology is the one which is finally going to let us build systems which are as optimal and as efficient as nature has done. Nature is not perfect. It has made mistakes, but we may have to do the same things. But these technologies, micro technologies, have an application from automobiles to agriculture, commercial electronics to cosmetics, energy to environment production, energy harvesting systems, and so on. But the greatest impact is going to come on medical field. Let me indicate few examples in medical field before I close. We have started creating what are called lab on chips. As the name itself indicates, it's a whole laboratory. When you give your blood for examination, he needs all those equipment, all those are built in a lab. Which operates with microliters or milliliters of fluids. Using what are called microfluidics technology. So when you give a blood in the morning and go away and give it and come back in the late in the afternoon, take it, nothing is like that. You can immediately operate on a chip and you can immediately find out what is the blood components and content within maybe an hour, half an hour. This will lead to what are called POCTs, point of care testing kits. As the name itself indi indicates, it's the point of care. You go to your doctor, he himself will analyze everything and they tell you. This point of care different kids don't even need medical supervision. Not science fiction. In India itself, we have developed. You go to Bombay IIT, you will see Professor Ram Mohan Rao demonstrating a, a cardiac chip. What happens in the, when you have a cardiac arrest is there are two blood proteins called myoglobin and troponin whose rate of change increases phenomenally. In a heart attack, first couple of hours is the most critical ones. So this chip, if you drop a blood, will tell you whether you have had a heart attack or not. What is the, state, the heart attack? What is the rate of change? So there are certain chips which you can buy today. Many of them are based on what are called micro cantilevers. A cantilever, which is probably tens of microns long. Remember, our height is, our hair is 100 microns, and a width of about 10 microns, and a thickness of one or half a micron. Material may could be a polymer, or could be a silicon. And you functionalize the cantilever with the required antigens. And when you drop a body fluid, 
the antibodies of the body fluid cling to the cantilever and load the cantilever. When you load the cantilever, the cantilever buckles. That buckling indicates you got that infection. Today, a company in, uh, in, Karnat, in Bangalore called Big Tech has put out uh, PCR chips which will diagnose HIV, rather uh, hepatitis immediately. There are people in India itself who are working on uh, these kind of systems to diagnose typhoid, TB, dengue, leptospirosis, and so on. Eric, all that you require is maximum of an hour or two. Today there are chips available which will give you the bl blood lipid control pro profile in two minutes with a drop of blood. So medic diagnostic is becoming very popular with this. The next aspect where it has a profound effect is drug delivery systems. And the most popular one being researched all over the world is insulin dispensing system. Because the world has a very large percentage of insulin. So in India, we have the dubious distinction of having 40% of the world diabetics in India. This chip has a micro needle. Micro needle is diameter is only about 10 microns and a bore of 2 microns. It hardly, is, you don't even feel, it's less than a mosquito bite. It draws blood and there's a micro pump built of either polymer or electrostatic materials and so on. It sucks the blood out and passes on to a lab on a chip which analyzes the glucose content of the blood and gives an instruction to a microcontroller which activates another micro pump which draws insulin from a vial and pumps it to the Blood. All of them packed in the form of a wristwatch with a micro battery. No longer a science fiction. You go to Indian Institute's Nano Center, most of the technologies necessary for this have been demonstrated. And we have tried it in a rat, whether the drug delivery system will work. And then there is the Endoscopic pill, which you might have heard of. You remember in the previous days when you went for uh, looking at uh, ulcer, they used to give you a tall glass of uh, a barium meal and you drink it and they trace it along as you go. But today you don't have to even do endoscopy. This pill, which is probably a centimeter or one and a half centimeters and few millimeters diameter, contains a CCD camera, a signal processing chip, on something like a Bluetooth to transfer signal to the external monitor and a micro battery all packaged in a biocompatible transparent polymer. You swallow it, as it goes down the GA canal, it takes the photographs and sends it outside. You go to Gangaram in Delhi, they are using, I don't know whether anybody is using it in Bangalore. But the only thing is this pill is a gravity feed system. If a physicist want to revisit it's not possible. So Koreans are building navigational things to this. From an external signal, two thrusters come out of the pill. And the physician can bring it up or down. No longer a science fiction. So the kind of things what one does, swallowable fills, Soluble electronics. Now there's what's called injectable electronics, which is the newest thing now going around. A conducting polymer mesh embedded with the electronics is dissolved in a solution and sucked in a needle, 10 microns needle, and put into the blood. And when it reaches the blood, it rather brain, it unfurls and can study neural activities. And it's going to be used for what is called DB, is deep brain scanning, which is a very important issue if you're serving from, suffering from Parkinson's disease. Where is the technology going? In mid-1960s, there was a movie called Fantastic Voyage. I don't know how many of you have had the opportunity to see it. Americans capture a 
uh, Russian general. And before they could get the secrets out, the Russian general is suffering from a cerebral thrombosis, the blood clot appearing in a very awkward place. Mad scientists strike. They build a miniature submarine and put four people, including paramedics, into the submarine. And by irradiation, they reduce the size of the submarine such that it could be injected into the intravenously. The submarine navigates itself to the brain, and in the brain, through a laser, remove, they remove the clot. But the body mechan defense mechanism attacks the submarine and destroys the submarine, and these four people are removed out of a tear drop and come back to life. This was a movie somewhere in 1960s. Today, we have a large number of technology available. They are thinking of what are called nanoprobes. And you swallow the nanoprobes, and their kinematics and distribution is studied by an atomic force microscope. The idea is, can we finally find out how tumor cells grow? By looking at how the angiogenesis, that is the growth of arteries take place. Can you put them into the blood and look at how neurofibrils grow so that we can really know how Alzheimer's come out? So you see, technology is a, such a facet, science and technology is, of course today science and technology is so decoupled, they are twin subverse space of a coin, you can't separate them out. Science begets technology. Science uses technology to produce more science. And more science begets more technology. So it's a never-ending chase. But, as I said, science and technology are not neutral activities. Today we want to look at nanomedicine. Do we know the long-term habits of nan nanoparticles inside the body? What are the toxicity effects? So these days I tell many of the people who do a technology seminar, you must include a, at least one session on what is the impact on society of this technology. And also something else. Science and technology is too important to be left to science and technologies alone. Policymakers, sociologists, philosophers, all are essential to make decision what it is. And you can't say, I didn't do it. Nuclear fission, which can be used to generate power, can also create a nuclear bomb. So the political decision. I'm sure all of you have read the letters which Einstein wrote to President of America. So science and technology is something which we don't understand. Even, even, in, even there's a saying in about 300 years back, if you walked on the street and asked anybody about science and technology, nobody knew anything. 100 years back, they knew something was there. But today, most of them know that it impacts them. They may not know what it is. So I have a feeling that uh, Nias and others look, look, start looking at arranging general science and technology lectures for a much and much larger public. Public must appreciate the impact of science and technology on society. Thomas Friedman's statement was not made out of, because he was a writer. Today something happens in America within the next hour or so, you're already reading it on your worldwide web. The books all come on electron, electronically. In fact, my granddaughter, which is, who is hardly three years old, walks into my room and says, your phone you're holding is very old, you don't Google enough. So look, look at the new lingo they are picking up. And look at how quickly the present day kid seems to take on the computer. Here I am struggling with my thing, and this goes blah, 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 and sends a, a SMS message. 
So we are co-evolving. Ray Kurzweil is right. Technology and humanity are co-evolving. When you co-evolve, you are going to reach a stage when you cannot distinguish one from the other. So your robot and you will be identical. Again, go back to Terminator 2. Anybody he voice, watches, he imitates their voice, he imitates their form. Is it going to be true? Who knows? Yesterday's science fiction is tomorrow's reality. I think we better get prepared to reality. Thank you. Friends, that was a very, very fascinating encounter in the past two, what the future holds. Floor is open for discussion. I'm sure a number of you have questions. Please feel free to ask your questions. I will answer if I can. <laughs> Please identify yourself when you are asking the question, your uh, affiliation and your uh, name. Yes, please. Lakshmi Narayan from uh, National Research Development Corporation, stationed in Bangalore. Sir, this is a general observation. In the 1960s, we have achieved the Green Revolution. In 1970s, we have achieved the Milk Revolution. And subsequently, we have achieved the Golden Revolution and the Blue Revolution. And when, we do, when do we expect India to have the Industrial Revolution, sir? It's a general observation. I don't know that the Modi's campaign of Make in India can be achieved in this, this, this decade. I was trying to stay away from looking at the scenario, Indian scenario, for several reasons. Last May, Nature, Canada, May 15th, the issue of Nature, Canada, a series of articles on the scenario of science and technology in India which was not all complimentary. We, we, somehow in India, we produce brilliant scientists. Indians are extremely good, no question about it. But somehow in India, we are not made India as good as Indians can. There are a number of reasons. One of them is obviously financing, subcritical. I have 10 rupees and give everybody two and a half rupees and go say jamun khalo. Where is jamun? I could have given it to one person and said, go and eat a dosa, perhaps he would have. Subcritical. The second thing is, if after all these years, please forget the three departments which are uh, the, the atomic energy, DRD, world, space, which are produced in spite of all these things, something. In, by and large, India has been unable to sustain high technology development. We don't even build a single helium neon laser in India. It's a barcode reader. There are lots of, lots of reasons, but things are changing. The change have change, changed phenomenally in the last 20 years, but our velocity of change is very slow. So will Modi's government uh, make in India work? Probably, as I said, I was the chairman of one of the task forces looking at making in India for defense. Will it work? I tend to think if they do whatever we have asked them to do, it will work. We have to build extraordinary academic institutions. One Indian Institute of Science is not enough for India. In America, if you don't, Stanford doesn't go to you, go to you, Berkeley, if you Berkeley doesn't go to you, go to you get Harvard. If Harvard doesn't go to you, Georgia attack. There are umpteen universities are coming up. We have to build world-class university. We, we, we graduate world-class people. But there are very few world kinds of universities. India, according to me, doesn't have a very healthy approach for science and technology. If you look at, I, I should say that, but if you look at the central government ministry, the person who is unfit for all the other measures, you give him a science minister. 
we, our attitude has to change. Pockets of islands of excellence among the media of uh, mediocrity is, is is not going to help India. Some changes are afoot. At least Modi's government's approach seems to be right. Will it get implemented? It's as uncertain as predicting the future of technology. <laughs> Next. Yes, please. So you have given a wonderful panorama of the future of science. Uh, when we talk about sustainability, can you tell about the limits of sustainability? For sustainability? When we talk, we sustainable. talk about limits, sustainable, <coughs> sustainable development, all these things. What is the limit? <laughs> Theoretically, sustainability has no limit. Yeah. Sustainability is automatically there. For example, if you consume one drop of water and if you produce one drop of water from recovery, your sustainability is there. But you must approach it differently. A couple of years back, I was in a agricultural seminar and where they were talking about how the nutrition in this soil has gone down, how soil must be redone in, a, in a essence. And we were trying to see how Americans are doing it. But then one uh, young boy, I should say boy, a PhD student came out. It's a wrong model. America has done farming for only 300 years. We have been farming for 3,000 years. So this soil depletion in India is quite different from the soil depletion in America. So if you follow American methods, American technology, yes, but American methods, it won't work. So sustainability can be produced provided you do. I have said, for example, what is the major thing this uh, Paris one does? They say, first re reforestation. If you remove one tree, plant one tree. And they have, they have a road map on how it can be done. And the temperature and what half of them is sustainability. Sustainability is not a new issue. We know that. But how do you implement it? There is a cost factor. There is a political factor. If you remove the political factor, cost factor can be on, tackled. So sustainability is something which can be achieved provided we want to achieve. Right, right star of harvesting. I remember when, for, for about uh, in 1984 or 85, uh, we had a oceanographic seminar in NPO L1. Uh, Walter Monk came from America and he was the man who first predicted sea surface temperature rise. And he wanted the uh, NIO go and uh, NP oil to look at some measurements. And he was, uh, and something which said is very important, which we all know, but we never consider. He said the amount of water which evaporates from the seas is equal to the total amount of precipitation on the earth. So if the water evaporates, if you collect every drop of water which precipitates on earth, you know it's a loss of water. But the precipitation may occur at different places. So rainwater harvesting is a, is a methodology of sustaining. And sun, I agree, sun probably will go off in about what, five billion years or something <laughs> like that. Till that time you have enough sun, sunlight, sustainable. And we can't even today in, in Bangalore, when you are talking about collecting garbage, they say recyclable garbage, we don't put them, we mix them and put it. We need an attitudinal change in India. We need what I consider as civic religion. That civil, civic aspect which affects others becomes much more important than personal. In fact, on the day you do it, I think you arrived. The lady there first. If yes, then do you think that science and technology has started challenging the God? 
Laplace. I won't answer that question, I will mean, answer him then. Laplace was a mathematician, wrote a book and took it to the French Prime Minister, President, and the press looked at it and said, you have not even mentioned God once. He said, sir, no need. Mine is everything rational and logical. God is a... Con I, I don't say I believe in God, I don't say I don't believe in God. Whether God created the humans as we are today is no longer tenable. Creation and evolution don't go together. If you read all the books, the creation is only 6,000 years old. But the earth came 44 billion years ago. The first living being was about 3.5 million years ago. You don't want to ask the question where God was. There is a book called Mind of God. I think you should read that. Finally, even Stephen Hawking says, if we cannot answer the, all the theological questions we, by science, we leave it to the priests and prayers. So God cannot be denied as an ultimate entity, perhaps. But by, for majority of the things which we do on earth today, there is no necessity of revoking God. God is more, according to me, is more of a solace. You want to worship when you're peaceful, have it. There's nothing wrong. You go to a guru, why? Not that he's a superhuman being, but he says something, brings your blood pressure down or a stress down and so on. Use God as the friend. I have no problem. But I, I, I myself am not really a theist. I don't believe in going to temples. But if my wife says she's going to the morning in the temple, I will join her. Because I don't lose anything. I don't need it. I don't have a requirement, but I don't have to deny. Yes, please. See. India is uh, open to world when globalization was introduced. By doing that, quality was ensured. But in the present context, when you go for make in India, how can you ensure quality when economy is tagged on to it? Quality is a concept which you know. I often talk about it. In fact, we had it one in one. So see, you're, you're one, one is Chinese approach. If you look at the Chinese fly squatters, they break down every other day. But Chinese have captured the market first. Whether this is a good thing works or not, and then you do it. How do you do it? In India, some of the other Indian innovation doesn't surface up. Indian innovation is restricted to certain class of people, as if it's certain class of people. <coughs> so the idea generated, another thing is in India, doomsday sayers are plenty. If you say, I want to do something, I have a new idea, the first thing they will say is, you can't do it. And then they give you reason why you should not do it. That is why some of the new things which we have started for technology, the startup companies, all augur well, but how do we pursue? And there is another thing which we seem to call Indian philosophy, as if philosophy is independent of the people's doing. Oh, Hindu rate of growth, this is our, what is all this nonsense? You want to reach excellence, you reach excellence. But look at what we did. No, it, things are changing, but 50 years back, if you said you are going for swimming and you want to become a swimming champion, no, 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 don't go to swimming, you will drown. We are always negative approach. As somebody said first, uh, we call this glass half empty. Instead of calling it half full. Its attitude of change required. India has all the ingredients. Brilliant people. I'm involved with a group called Agastya, which goes for village education. I go to villages where they can hardly speak, but you look at their faces of innovation. It's internal. 
Can we make it come out? Can you build structures to make it come out? Trigger it. All of us have innovative mind inside. It need not all, everybody need not be an Einstein. There is only one Einstein, and Einstein has never been created again. So we, we, we need an attitudinal change in India. We need a freedom to think in India, which these days is being questioned very strongly. It is rather interesting, you have to be unconventional. In, a, in his famous book, uh, Man and Superman, George Bernard Shaw says, a conventional person adapts himself to environment. An un unconventional people adapts the environment to himself. And most of the development takes place from the unconventional people. India, we do, we suppress that. We require attitudinal change. Everything else is there, money, policy, can all be handled. We need attitudinal change. But unfortunately, the people sitting in this room have already had that attitudinal change. There is no point in preaching to you. The people who have to be preached are elsewhere. So we need attitudinal change and we can make it. We, we can't do it the way China did. China is, a, China is a command society. We are a pluralistic society. So the way you approach our problem has to be by consensus. What else? It will come, it will come. Automatically it will come. Quality is on demand. How come we have started building automobiles? The demand, market pull. You, you cannot accept. We must change our attitude. I, I give a very simple example. The grandchild or your child, when he comes, comes oh, I scored 19 in mathematics. Some of you immediately say, but you scored only 65 in physics. As if scoring 19 is a decoupled. So we must get away from this negative attitude. Individually we are okay. Collectively we are very poor. Do you think the parliament members don't, don't know that what they are doing is nonsense? I can't believe it. But they will keep doing it. Because we keep electing them again and again. We need attitudinal change. All of us must change. And see, like we are talking about obscurantism and other things. There is nothing wrong if somebody wants to go and worship as long as it doesn't affect the other parts of this. If somebody believes, fine. What is wrong? There, there is a book written, written uh, the thesis of uh, Stanford University called The End of Faith. Mainly it talks about Islam and what is happening to Islam. And it talks about, uh, well, if somebody said, uh, normally for others other than Islam, if somebody said there is a God, Bo, will we do it? No. If you put a statue there and a carving, they immediately say, it's purely attitude change. And those of us who have achieved something, we have done something, we have had that attitude change that somehow inbuilt in us already. We to accept. You go to your university, you go to IJN University, each professor is an individual, but it doesn't mean that you cannot get along, isn't it? So those are the people who have produced something for India, who have contributed something for India, have already had that attitude no changes. Your question is? Uh, even as a scientific advisor, I was a political. I didn't want to even talk to anybody political except for the work. Number of parties and other things don't do. I, I think if you allow people. Fair enough. Who are they? They were also like you. I am sure when they were in the schools, as students, they argued exactly the same way you argued, but when they became politicians, they didn't. I talked to a number of these people individually. <laughs> I'll quote a, a rather obscure example on the 
first one if you will see a first uh, flight on january 4th 2001 shortly after that there was a defense committee before which we had to go to present suresh kalmadi sitting in that uh, that stage he was with the member he said now that lc has flown the project should be closed i said come again <laughs> can you explain what you said now that the lc has flown project should be closed then i said uh, mr kalmadi i thought he would have gone the other way around the pro- lc had not flown it uh, could be closed why did you say that afterwards when you had tea he is from karnataka i know him well we started what he did forget that all i say if this is the approach we should elect him irrespective of how much we argue finally the government is a reflection of the population you and i may say we didn't vote that doesn't count he has been elected in democracy the only power you have is voting so if you don't want to vote to too many parties what to two parties bring two party system But at one stage we had nearly had a two party system but in, if you want to build a country with a federation of states as india is now slowly becoming you can't avoid regional parties so it's not just an attitude. as i said individually you talk to politician everybody will agree with you what you say but collectively put as a party it won't sometimes i argued i have argued a lot with uh, uh, george fernandez and others this whip i used to always tell him giving everybody vote i said is anti democratic how can you have a democracy and give a whip <laughs> i said this is oxymoron but that's how the parties work that's how we allowed them to work So attitude change is necessary not just between two people, two of us, a billion people. At least sixty thousand, sixty percent or seventy percent need an attitudinal change. Sir, I think this particular change should start from school teachers. They don't read other than their textbooks. What is your opinion? People of my age. still remember this primary school and middle school teachers not the college and teachers they have had a greater impact because they taught they taught you values today teachers don't do values because the life has become very tough survival becomes a problem as somebody said india the things which you can get, get take it for granted in the west cannot be taken for granted every morning uh, In, in my house, for example, every morning I would go and see whether the water corporation water is coming. Corporation water doesn't come. Is there electricity? So we get stuck by mundane problems. Science is not a mundane activity. It is not a tap which you can turn on and off. You need time to think, time to consolidate. So when we solve those problems, automatically it comes out. India is moving. One of the things which you should know, also notice is that India is never going to collapse like what happened to USSR. It slowly oscillates and goes up. There cannot be a cataclysmic change in India. All of us must try for changes. Changes by convincing somebody, not by dictums and rules. legislation doesn't solve the problem according to me the more rules you make the worse becomes the society so you must look at changes from many many different angles starting um, but science and technology is nothing else in fact there are book written called is science the salvation we don't know whether science is the salvation finally theology may be the salvation we don't know but you cannot neglect science because you need creature comforts you need wealth you want to take a vacation you want to go by a plane you want a color tv you want a 14 inch color tv you want a what is that curved screen color tv tomorrow 
You need money. And money can come only by technology, whether it's driven by science or otherwise. In your lecture, you have used the word serendipitous in hmm. context of discovery. What it really means? Uh, not intended by surprise. Serendipity means something which was not. Rantajan, the way we came by accident. Rantanya had left some papers in a drawer, went away, and when he came back, he suddenly found that the radiation had produced that. Many of the science discoveries are serendipitous. And then you try to find an explanation for that. Even discovery of electrons were, in a way, serendipitous. Uh, in your speech, it was mentioned optically invisible. Uh, means what, sir? Can you please elaborate? Okay, this is a material. When light impinges on the material, generally you get it reflected. Okay? Some of them reflected, some of them pass through. In this particular material, if the light hits it, it goes on the surface. No light comes back. When no light comes back, you don't see it. So it's an optical cloak. It has been demonstrated in the laboratory. So it, uh, because it depends on the reflection coefficient or what that those say. So when it generally is the reflected light, you see. If there is no reflection, if it passes through, you see an image. But if it goes on the surface, you you won't see the light coming back. That's an optical visibility. It goes around the object which you have put. Reflectivity is zero. And refractivity is also zero. So it doesn't penetrate. Whether it can be used in a large scale or not, but lab demonstration it has been done. It's called an invisible cloak. You put that on. Suddenly you see a void. Then somebody may say even the void is itself is a recognition. But what is inside the void is not known. Give the mic uh, Many of our Indian students, uh, because I went around uh, many colleges and all in the rural area, including at towns and all. Today they prefer uh, to go abroad for higher education and all. It is expensive. Maybe the quality of education is better as of now. But when we can expect that an Indian student, he will himself satisfy that in India also uh, academic institutions are there. Uh, there is no need to go abroad uh, equally important, equally comparable institutions are there in India. When we can expect? <laughs> you, you must go, go, go and ask uh, this uh, tarot card reader or somebody who can tell you when it will happen. It has to happen. Till that happens, India won't strike. When it will happen, I don't know. Because, you see, going up, whether you like it or not, today America is the crucible of science and technology. We all look towards the West. For, for, if you want a cure for a, a, a cancer, you look at what uh, uh, the American University, the Mayo Clinic does, or Goddard's, uh, and so on. If you want something in aeronautics, you go to the Goddard Space Center and ask and do it. They built institutions like that. How did they build institutions like that? They didn't build it on the Americans. They said, wherever the talent is in the world, my doors are open to you. Today we talk about, uh, yesterday we were, I was uh, I spent some, you know, somewhere along with Radham Narsimha, you might have heard his name. I was talking about him and then he was giving a speech on what is called Car Carmen, Von Carmen, who went to Caltech. Von Carmen built virtually the Caltech fluid mechanics division. He was an outsider. When you build institutions of that kind, today there are a few institutions. Some IITs and now the ISERCs, some of them are good. Few IITs which attract people. That is why a guy who tends, comes from Tirunal Valley, he says, uh, if he gets a seat in uh, uh, IIT Karakpur, he says it's too far. 
But if he gets to Stanford, he thinks Stanford is next door to his house and goes there. <laughs> so because the institutions have been built like that. Our institutions are hardly 100 years old. Harvard must be now, what, 300 years old, approximately? Must be. must be 300 years old. Certainly Cambridge and Oxford are 300 years old. They have to evolve. We have not evolved to that extent. We are a very immature democracy. And we do not consider science and technology as important enough. Everybody who needs science need not become a scientist. We, we, science is a methodology of thinking. The scientific temper which Nehru start, talked about. We must build those things in our society. must build it. To, today, you, 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 you can talk about it, saying that edu education is important. Today, without education, you can't do it. Education, I don't mean you get a PhD degree. But whenever I see that some of my friends say, oh, go to, oh, DV Gudapa didn't have any education. Yes, there are people who didn't have education, but had some given gift where it came, we don't know. Genetics someday will probably answer. So I don't know when India will become. I, I, I have a feeling we are on the way up. But you must have an exponential growth, and our exponential growth is still lingering around here. It has not gone around the bend. When it goes around the bend, only you will see the exponential growth. Maybe next year, 15, 20 years. India has a maximum of 15, 20 years, according to me. If it doesn't change within that time, we are going to remain mediocre forever. Somehow one of the most unfortunate thing what we see in science in India is science and scientific outlook don't go together. Uh, scientists most of the time shy away from the social issues and uh, therefore science contribution to social modernization doesn't happen the way we would have expected for instance our caste system or other kind of social prejudices would have been addressed by scientists in a, in a way uh, they would have taken stand on it probably would have faced you know, sort of passed that phase and would have been different uh, social dynamics today rather than you know, staying in the same medieval mindset uh, in most of the you know, things and the uh, doings we do in every, do every day life. So you comment on that. Look, I have to think this so-called caste system, the impact of caste and other things were going down. One man ruined the whole thing called V.P. Singh. V.P. Singh suddenly removed the Mandal Commission. Till that by that time it was slowly going down and it again clicked up. So that rigging has to go down. It will probably take another 30, 40 years before it goes down. We have slowly come to accept it, we have started living in it. And if you ask your child, or they, they say, the child haven't asked the person sitting next to him or her in the class what religion he belongs. We are slowly dying down and suddenly we get political. Finally, whether you like it or not, politicians decide the policy of a nation. So, I remember when India got its independence, there was a light never to by Will Durant, who wrote a number of books on the history of civilization. He commented about India saying, democracy without education is hypocrisy without limitation. It's becoming true. We have to accept that. When I hear this part about the speeches given in the parliament, I cry, is this what the debate is about? <laughs> silly, silly points. If a student in your class had done that, he would have thrown him out long back. So we are not in a world. And we, there's a multiple Indias. India which belongs to us. We do our work. There's something happens. We do our work. Keep to ourselves. And we are evolving. But India is not evolving. That is why we hope on Modi. 
his oratory and skills and others gave us an impression that India may evolve. We still don't know the answer. The jury is out. But, uh, but we cannot elect a politician because of what is called Tina factor. There is no alternative. We have been doing that. Whereas, in, fortunately, in science and technology, there is no Tina factor. That is where we are some level. We are, we are respected all over the world for our science and technology. I have never heard of an Indian student flunking in America. All of them have done well. So there is a lot of talent in us. Inherently we are talented people. But somehow the mantana is not there. On that note, I think we will churn a lot of thoughts for us to churn in ourselves and come forward. My request that we came back to give a vote of thanks. Thank you, sir. I feel privileged to be here to give a vote of thanks to Dr. Atre for his excellent, informative and thought-provoking talk on science, technology and the future. Sir, we feel elated that you are here and we are with you here and we are hearing you. And not only me, all the participants will agree that we all feel elated that you are here and we heard you in person. So we thank you for such a nice talk, sir. We also thank Dr. Rajaram Nagappa for chairing the session. A special thanks to Dr. Baldev Raj for inviting Dr. Atre and arranging such a nice lecture, sir. So on behalf of all the participants, uh, I thank you from the core of our hearts. Thank you, sir.